Well, good morning. I heard one, two, three, four, five, more. Isn't it a great weekend? Oh my gosh, let's bottle these days and use them in January. (laughs) Hey, I got an amen. I haven't even started the message yet. I had the pleasure yesterday, it was a gorgeous day, of attending the wedding of my business partner, Kyle, to his new bride, Reagan. Man, it was just great. To see the beaming smile on my partner, my friend's face, as he's getting married and just, um, you know, drinking in the day. And the parents are there and the siblings are there and they're all telling stories about the bride and groom. You know, I've got a lot of ammunition now. (laughs) For my business partner. But they're, you know, they're telling, it occurred to me as I was sitting there listening to them and just kind of taking in the day, which is amazing. Uh, they, everyone was telling a story about who the bride and the groom were. And we were witnessing something that was being created, a new union. They couldn't speak to what those people are together. That new thing, husband and wife, was being created right before our very eyes. And despite all the calls of well-wishers to never change, we all know that any of us that have been married for any point in time, that you change (laughs) because you adapt, you learn, you grow because of this new union you've created. And and, uh, despite all the calls to never change, they need to change, and they will change. And nowhere is that more true than in our Christian union. When we became united with Christ, we too need to change. And so it's been part of the study that we've been going through, and we've been looking at this verse, Ephesians 5. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise but as wise, making the most of every opportunity. And we've been talking about being careful how we live. If we are now united with Christ, it means that we adopt a different way of relating just as we do when we get when we get married we we discover there are some things that mean that we got to change some things about our our behaviors and our peculiarities and our annoyances that maybe we need to soften a little bit maybe we need to take out some of the things that we've been doing and look at that and figure out how we're going to change In our first week, we talked about living like an explorer, and we have these cards. I think they're out on the table if you don't have one. Live like an explorer with the idea that we're going to move forward always trusting in God's promises. And then we looked at living like an investor, and that we're going to always look at ways in which we can invest our time, talent, and treasure as God directs us. And then we talked about living like a builder, that we'll leave others better than we found them. And today, I want to talk about living like a temple. We're we're actually to be a building, a very special kind of building, a temple. Let's pray with me. Father, we thank you for this place that we can gather together. We thank you for the freedom that we have to do that. We thank you for your word and the power of your word to change lives. Lord, I pray right now that we would not leave here unchanged, each one of us, that your word would uh, soak into our hearts, that you would reveal to us what's pleasing to you and the things that we need to do to respond to your love and grace that you've given us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, buenos dias, feliz domingo. If you haven't figured out, I'm learning Spanish. I'm not doing it all that well. But I'm having fun with it. But I realize, how many of you have learned a second language? Okay, so you know there's a lot of memorization involved, right? I don't, I, it, it, it's, it's difficult to kind of understand how to memorize stuff for me. I'm not really good at memorizing. But, you know, in Spanish and in all languages, um, well, most all languages, there's gender form. So um, I know this from uh, a little bit of German that I grew up with. But, uh, you know, you have to learn the fact that dias, is, uh, is, which is day, is masculine, which is why I said buenos. 
But if we're having this message in the afternoon, it'd be Buenas uh, Tardis, because uh, Buenas Tardis, Tardis is afternoon, is in the feminine form. I don't know why it changes form from time of day to another time of day, but it's just something you got to know. It's something you got to remember. Something you, if you want to speak in a language, you need to memorize things. I've been told uh, that their uh, English language is one of the worst languages to learn, so I'm really glad I didn't need to do that. Give you a minute. <laughs> you know, we all have, I guess the point of this is, we all have some memory work to do. We all have some work to do on remembering things that we know, but we may have forgotten. You know, I, I love having Anna with me, um, all the time. I just love being with her. But part of what I love being with her about is that she reminds me of stuff I've forgotten. Like where we were on a certain time or what the kids did on a certain occasion. And she's kind of my memory bank. Does that work for any of you that are married to the other? They're kind of like, they serve as your off-person memory system. It's it's like if Anna's not with me, it's like me not having my cell phone. I, I feel like a part of me is not able to be the best part of me because, in fact, she shares my brain cell. Actually, she keeps my brain cell. But we're going to talk about a vital choice number four, and that is this. We can either live like a temple or we can live like a tomb. We can live like a temple or we can live like a tomb. Now, this is a little bit tricky. Because I'm putting to you a choice that really isn't a choice about temple or tomb, because that's already taken off the table. If we are believers in Christ, if you believe in Christ, as I believe in Christ, then we're already a temple. So the choice isn't whether we are a temple or not. We're not a tomb, because God created us with life. The question isn't whether we're a temple or a tomb. The question is, are we living like a temple, or are we living like a tomb? You know, we hang signs out at sports stadiums. You'll see this often, right? You go to a sports stadium, you'll see, what, 1 John 3.16. Well, the Apostle Paul hung another sign up for the church at Corinth, and it read this way. 1 Corinthians 3.16. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's Spirit lives in you? Corinth was one of the most culturally diverse cities in the Roman Empire. Paul wrote these words as a reminder to them. They're culturally diverse because they were in the, a key part of a Mediterranean route where merchants would travel. And of course, they brought their customs to the area, and it infected the church. But if you read through the book of First and Second Corinthians, you'll find that Paul was dealing with all kinds of divisions. There were a group of believers back then in the Corinthian church that, that wanted to follow a guy by the name of Apollos. He was a teacher. He was a very eloquent teacher. And he was a little bit from the, uh, the, the upper class. And so they were attracted to his style of teaching. And then there were those that preferred the Apostle Paul. He was not nearly as eloquent. And, and, and he was a working man. So you had a little bit of class warfare in the church. You had those who wanted Apollos to be the spokesperson. They were going to follow after him, and you had those that wanted to follow after Paul. And so when a division was arising within the church of Corinth, there was sexual promiscuity and perverseness of really the worst kind. There were pagan practices, and, and the church itself was no longer set apart. They forgot who they were. And so Paul puts up the sign, 1 John, 1 Corinthians 3.16. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and God's spirit lives with you? And you know what it is? It's that way with us too, right? Isn't it easy to forget, forget who we are? We're not a tomb. We're a temple. In Ephesians chapter 2, it says this, Because of his great love for us, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions, it is by grace that you have been saved. You see, we used to be a tomb. We used to be walking around. We used to think 
before we met the Lord that we had life. But the Bible says that's not life. That's death. That's the tomb. And what I have to offer you, Jesus says, when you believe in me, is eternal life. And by the way, eternal life doesn't just start when you die. Eternal life starts when you accept Christ. Because it's the life of heaven that is being brought down into you. It's not a quantity of time, it's a quality of time that, that uh, Jesus describes when he talks about eternal life. And the, one of the phrases that we need to rid ourselves of in Christian speak is, I gave my life to Christ. You have no life to give to Christ. You got your life from Christ. There is no life to give him. What you gave him was death. What, that was a tomb. You were resurrected with him. That is life that he gave you. In fact, if you look a few verses before the Ephesians 5.15 verse that we've been looking at about how you then shall live, Paul writes these words, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. And get this, live as children of light. He is describing the character of what we are. We're light of the Lord, describing the character of something. And do you notice now there's a command to live like the character I'm just describing? Okay, so the implication is it's easy to not live like the way we're describing, right? There's incongruity. And so the command here is to live as children of light. In other words, live the way you are meant to be, the way God designed you to be. You can't be alive if you're dead, but you can play dead if you're alive. The best illustration I heard about this is... um, from David Needham, he wrote a book called Birthright, and six years ago, I shared this illustration with you. How many remember that? See? We forget, don't we? So I'm going to share this illustration again, because actually it's the best metaphor I've found to describe what happens in the Christian experience. You see, because David Needham talks about the, the Christian life is a bit like a factory that creates poisonous gas. The purpose of this gas is to kill things. And that's what it does. It stamps out bottles and bottles and bottles of poisonous gas. It's toxic. And it's used to, like I said, kill things, destroy, hurt. But then one day, an acquisition comes in. And the acquirer decides we're going to change the mission of this organization. We're going to change the mission of this factory. The factory still remains, but now instead of producing poisonous gas, we're going to produce life-saving oxygen. A change in mission, but the factory remains the same. The factory is our flesh. The factory is the thing that we're operating in. And you see, in in the old way, You had to have a gas mask to stay protected with the nerve gas that was being produced. But in the new way, the spirit produces oxygen, and an oxygen mask is promotive, isn't it? It brings health and life. And so this transformation from this role of being a factory that once produced nerve gas now is occupied by Jesus Christ leading that factory is saying, No longer are we producing nerve gas. We're producing life-saving oxygen. Get that? That's the transformation that God did within us. But here's the rub. The old patterns still apply. People still do the stuff that they once did before. Every once in a while, somebody on the factory line burps out a bottle of poisonous gas. And somebody over in accounting decides, oh, I can fudge the numbers a bit and get things up. Or somebody in sales over-promises and under-delivers. You know, there's all kinds of ways in which a corrupt organization has the habits of corruption. And that's what's true with us. We have to deal with the habits of corruption that we have in the flesh, even though we have a new spirit, a new mandate, a new thing for us to do, a new mission, 
But we have to be transformed into that mission. We have to see the old patterns and say, no, that isn't keeping in keeping where the mission of my life is going. Or as one friend said when he thinks about what he wants to do, he says, is the choice that I'm about to make consistent with the person that I want to become? It's a great question. And it's the kind of question we have to ask ourselves every day. The choice is ours. How much toxin are we going to allow our lives to create? Because we're holy and we're meant for one thing, but sometimes we burp out stuff that's not good for us. And so Paul reminds us that we're a building. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, he says, we're God's fellow workers, you are God's field, God's building. But not just any building, mind you, a temple. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, he puts it this way. We are a temple of the living God. As God had says, I will live with them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Now, where does that happen? Right here. Right here in our hearts. Now, imagine if you were a Jewish believer in the Corinthian church at the time, a new convert perhaps to Christianity because this is a new church, Imagine you have all these images of what temple means, and Paul says, you're a temple. And we're used to hearing this word, perhaps, maybe not, but we're used to hearing certain ways to describe the Christian experience, but this would be a totally new thing for them to think about, because a temple had a deep significance for a Jewish believer. The temple in Jerusalem is the holiest place in Ju- Judaism, and this temple was built on the site of that God told Abraham to sacrifice Isaac. Now, you remember in our first study when we talked about being an explorer, that God's promise to Abraham was that his seed would be countless, more than the stars of the heaven, more than the the sands on the the ground. So 24-7 reminder that it would be countless. And here it is, the very place that Abraham was asked to sacrifice Isaac, and knowing, believing that God would rescue him, he provided a ram as a way to sacrifice without losing uh, Isaac. And it says in the New Testament that it's, it's as if he received his son back. This is the holiest place, the temple. You cannot, in a Jewish mind, say a place that is holier than this place. You get that? And now Paul is saying, you are that place. That's a big thing. You see, it's easy to read the Scripture and kind of go, okay, that's a temple thing. But for them to say that was to say, you are the holiest place there is on earth. That would be the modern day way of saying that to us. You are the holiest place there is on earth. And the Apostle Paul is saying, now live like it. Now live like it. So there are three things that I want to have us all think about this morning with respect to being a temple person, to living like the holiest place on earth. And that is the first one is that a temple person has a devoted heart. That's what you expect when you go to a temple is to see people who are devoted to God. It's what we expect when we come here to church, to be surrounded by people who also love the Lord, as we do. And in Psalm 84, it says this, How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord Almighty! My soul yearns, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home, and the shallow swallow a nest for herself, where she may have her young, a place near your altar, O Lord Almighty, my God, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. This is what's true about the house that God dwells in. It's lovely. See how lovely. It's a place of yearning. Our flesh cries out for it. It's a home safe from harm. You see the sparrows, they, they build their nest and they raise their young. It's an intimate place because it's near your altar. My king, my God, those are possessive words. This psalm of David's is is dripping with devotion. And it's finally, it's a place of blessing. Jesus was asked, what's the greatest commandment? And he answered in Mark chapter 12, 
to love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength. If we only needed one verse in the Bible to meditate on every day and come up with new ways to do it, this would be it. A a number of years ago, a a couple of guys and I, we'd been meeting for probably five or six years doing a, a, a weekly Bible study, and one time we decided to go through the book of Ephesians And the way in which we approached it was to say, we're going to read a few verses together until something pops. You know what I'm saying? It's like you sometimes read the scripture, there's a little speed bump. You slow down, you go, whoa, wait a minute, i got to take that one in. So anytime one of the three of us would find a speed bump as we read together, we'd stop. That's it. Then the study turns from identifying what God might be speaking to us as to now how do we apply that. And we agreed that we would not move on from that verse week after week until we've each applied that. So it kind of created accountability. If you want to keep going, the other two have to find a way to apply what we just learned. And we have to report back on it. Okay? So you no, more, no forward progress unless you've applied the verse. And then we get to Ephesians 5.1 where it says, Therefore be imitators of God. We're like, Okay. I think we might be permanently stuck here. Because this is the thing that you do every day. The thing that there's something more always to work on, isn't there? You see, in the temple, they offered sacrifices and they, and they went there to get holy, to be absolved of sin. They, they did it because they had a devoted heart and they loved the Lord more than their mistakes. Of course, they left offerings of uh, sacrifice that were grains, birds, livestock, And they went to the temple to do that. But today, we are the temple, and God resides in our heart. We don't need to go to the Mount of Moriah. It has come to us. It dwells within us. And uh, and it's here where we make our offerings. And that is where Romans 12 comes in. As Paul tells the Roman church, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and pleasing to God, this is your spiritual act of worship. Do not be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. I want you to notice a few things about this verse. First of all, we're the living sacrifice. We're not a dead sacrifice. We're a living sacrifice. Somebody once pointed out the problem with the living sacrifice is they crawl off the altar. We do that too. We kind of want to sneak away from making the sacrifices and the commitments that we know we need to make in our own lives to become more Christ-like. But I want you to pay attention to this middle verse here because it says, do not be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. To be transformed by the renewing of your mind is basically a shorthand for saying, change the way you think to conform to who you are. God made you to be holy. And we need to think and get rid of the stuff that keeps us from doing that. See, we honor God by remembering what we are and by living accordingly. Not out of obligation, but but out of love. And if you notice the last part of that verse, then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. You see, all of this is designed because we want to have a heart that loves God, is devoted to God, and we want to please Him. You know, it, it's no different than in a marriage. I mean, uh, I was in a study group with some guys, and we, the topic turned to, how can we better support our wives in our marriage? So, as you probably figured out, my custom is to not leave studies without having an action step. We all committed to each other a different thing that we would do this week. It was just a one-week commitment, but like what could help our wives this week, in, even if it's in a small way, it's a start, right? So in my small way, I committed to doing the laundry, which was kind of interesting the first time I did it because I didn't know about color separation, and Anna wanted to know why all of her white shirts were now red, and, but she was appreciative of the fact that I took the step to try it. It's not a big thing. It's something I tried to do. Sometimes when you help somebody, you actually aren't really helping them much because they have to go back and fix what you did. 
But I got the hang of it. In fact, I still do laundry to this day, and that's been probably now 20 years. It's one thing that makes life a little bit easier for her, and she does countless things like that for me. But the thing about it, and the, the point of that illustration is that when you love someone, you do something for them. When we love God, the test of that is are we transforming our mind? Are we actively taking captive thoughts that we know don't honor Him? Are we doing things out of a devoted spirit that says, I'm willing to kind of like deal with this issue in my life because I love God? And that's the end of it. And He's made me to be a temple. The second thing that a temple person has is a filled spirit. The other reason the Jews went to the temple and the same reason we go to church today is to give praise. We had a great time of worship this morning, giving praise. And Psalm 100, verse 4 says, Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. This is what we do. This is what you do here. Imagine going to a church and there's no worship. Would you feel like you got the, the, the experience you were looking for? No, we come here because we want to give thanks to God. We want to be able to express our gratitude. We want to enter into joy with other people who are doing the same. It's interesting when you look at Jesus, he just departed. The disciples have seen him go off into heaven after he was raised from the dead. And where do you find the disciples? It says in Luke chapter 24, and they stayed continually at the temple. What were they doing? Praising God. The temple is where the Spirit of God resides, and it's where Jesus was too. Notice when he was a little kid, at the age of 12, his family took him to Jerusalem, and the, he, family, him and the rest of his family, to Jerusalem for the Passover feast. And on their way home, they discover a day later that Jesus wasn't with them. This is every parent's nightmare is that their kid gets left behind somewhere. So they go back and they search frantically for him and they find him in the temple courts. And Jesus' question to them when they ask, why are you here, is a lot like Paul's question to the Corinthian church. He says, why were you searching for me? Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? I mean, if you knew who I was, this would not be a hard thing for you to figure out. And the Bible goes on to say they didn't understand, which is another way of saying there was something there for them to understand, but they didn't get it at the time. And so that is what's true for us, is that we have to think about the place that we are in our lives and how we take the temple that we have and, and turn it into a place where we are giving praise. So the temple is a place that we learn about God and we give gratitude for who He is and what He's done for us. And if you read the book of Acts, you'll see the disciples were filled with the Spirit of God. And what's interesting to me as I look at that, number of fillings of the Spirit of God, the overwhelming, they faced persecution, did they not? But you don't see an alarm. You don't see worry. Why? Because they knew God. They knew His Spirit dwells in them. But, you know, I forget that. And any time I worry, it's a sign that I've forgotten something about God's sovereignty and God's presence in my life. Worry is that dashboard light that lights up to tell me that. And that's why Paul said to be careful how we live. And right after that, he tells us to be filled with the Spirit. Let's look at this passage, this central passage that we've been studying, Ephesians 5.15. Let's look at it a little bit further. You know, I opened it in week one, and now week four, we're actually going to look at the passage. <laughs> Ephesians 5.15. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, Speak to one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord and always give thanks to the God, the Father, for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Does that not sound like a temple? Instead, be filled. Instead, speak to one another in song 
Instead, make music in your heart. Instead, always give thanks. He is describing the practices of a temple person. Be joyful in the way that you speak to one another, that you speak in a way that's like song-like. Instead of biting or harsh or, or, or not at all. And make music in your heart. Have a joy in your, in your heart because you're filled with the Spirit and you know who God is. You know what He is doing. You know His presence within you. These are things a temple person does. Finally, a temple person has a life-giving disposition. You see, the other reason a Jew would go to the temple is to get help. To get help in times of trial, and, and people always cry out to God whenever they're, um, oftentimes for the first time in their life, whenever they were um, uh, going through times of need. You remember hearing from Tom Trzinski from um, the Adult Teen Challenge. He's laying on, on the road after a motorcycle accident. Some of his body parts are elsewhere. And what was his words? He cried out, God, save me. And he had no relationship with God prior to that. And it's something that we often turn to. In 2 Samuel, David's song of praise says this, In my distress I called to the Lord, I called out to my God, and from His temple He heard my voice, and my cry came to His ears. You know, when you're in trouble, you run to Dad's house to get help, to get life. You go to Dad to get a blessing. And when Moses was saying farewell to the children of Israel after 40 years of leading them through the desert. He was told that he would not be able to cross over with them, but he left them some powerful words in the farewell that he gave to Joshua and other Israelites before they crossed the Jordan says this in Deuteronomy chapter 30. This day I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Now choose life so that you and your children may live, and that you may love the Lord your God. Listen to his voice and hold fast to him. For the Lord is your life, and he will give you many years in the land he swore to give to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This seems like an easy thing. We've been talking about language because I'm learning Spanish, but I want you to notice one thing in this verse. There's a declaration and there's a command. The declaration is, for the Lord is your life. There is nothing that you can do if you believe in Jesus Christ. There's nothing that you can do to change the fact that he is the Lord in your life. But the command is, choose life. You see, we can always live with the Lord, but we can live with the Lord and not choose to live in a way that has life. We we could choose to not live in a way that has blessing. We can choose to live in a way that is cursing rather than blessing. And so we have that choice, always to bless or to curse. And temple people choose to bless. They choose to give life to others. It's part of the living sacrifice that we make to bless others. In Romans chapter 12, it says, Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Now, It's easy to read that and go, I I don't really feel like I have anybody persecuting me, so I don't really need to do much on the blessing thing. If you think you're off the hook because you don't have any persecutors in your life, you're not. He's only saying, these are the hardest people to bless, so bless them. If you can bless them, you can bless anyone. And we are to bless them. We do it not because we're gathering anything from ourselves, but because we are a temple, and the Holy Spirit lives within us. And it is natural to go into a temple to receive blessing. When people visit us, when people encounter us, they ought to also receive blessing. It's interesting that he puts that, follows that right up with rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. I find this, for me personally, it's easier for me often to get jealous with those who rejoice because they have something that maybe I wanted and they got or to step away from those who are mourning because I don't know how to deal with it and it might take too much time for me to get messy with them you see how easy it is to just say I'm not going to be a blessing today But we are to lean into those who rejoice and genuinely celebrate with them. Even if we can't share that for ourselves, we're to share it with them. 
And we're to lean into those who are mourning and to also bless them by our presence. Regardless of our ineptitude in knowing what to do, we're not there to solve a problem. We're there to give comfort and to give blessing. Worship team, you can come on up whenever you're ready. So it leads to the question, how do I bless another? You know, I was reading um, in my uh, quiet time yesterday a very familiar passage. It, it actually, I thought it might be brought up at the wedding because it's 1 Corinthians 13. And we all know 1 Corinthians 13 is your standard wedding text of Scripture. It wasn't. But I was reading, and, it, and, and I thought, okay, you know, I kind of got this. It's very familiar. It may be over-familiar. But I stopped at the third word, when it says love is patient. And God had me stop right there and just stop and just say, if all you work on today is patience, how might that transform you? And I remembered, (laughs) it was like he was trying to work on just this little annoyances that I can have Like I'm coming home after a really long day at work on Friday night in Twin Cities traffic, and everybody was going in the direction I was going. I don't know what the deal was. But it wasn't just everybody that was going there. Everybody that was going in the direction I was going, they're all flaming idiots. The way they drive is astonishingly bad. If I had my video camera going, it would have made a great YouTube video cut except for the part about me calling them idiots and going boom and getting agitated. And it was like God was saying, love is patient. What can you do as part of that? Patience was the check engine light on my love dashboard, and it was going off. What could I do to just do that? So here's the question we have to ask ourselves. You know, am I willing to exchange attention on me to bless someone else? Stop living like a tomb where the, where the stink and rot of selfish desire sits, but brought out to somebody else. Do I take seriously their situation and genuinely help them pray? Do I even inquire? Would others describe me as on edge or and often irritated? Do I treat others better than those I live with? Would others describe me as life-giving or high-maintenance? How would others know when I'm discouraged? Do I do more shopping or more drinking or have more anger or more binge eating or maybe I'm more, more withdrawn? Where do I turn to to get life? You see, all these things are distractions from what God would have us do. Our choice today is to consider how we're going to live as a temple or as a tomb. We can be alive, distinctive, inspiring life for others, becoming more Christ-like, or we can rot in selfish desires. You know, A tomb holds you captive, but Jesus sets you free and sets up a temple within you. So we now need to do some, maybe some housekeeping. You know, Nehemiah led an entire mission in his day to rebuild the temple. And we may need to do the same in our own lives. What living sacrifice do you need to make today? You know, he's on a mission inside of you and inside of me to clean his temple. And so what is he asking you today to get rid of? What is, he, what is it that is keeping you from being fully devoted, filled with the Spirit, free with life-giving expression to others? What inner thoughts do you need to take captive to become more holy? You know, the Bible says we're in union with Christ. The old is gone, the new is here. It's like that great wedding celebration that should forever change us. As you give thought to those ways in which God might be speaking into your heart, give it to Him as a commitment, as a living sacrifice of praise and worship. Lord, we thank You for this time that we have this morning. We thank you for the power of your word, and we thank you more even so that you dwell right in our hearts, that your Holy Spirit is within us. And so, Father, help us tidy up our temple, that it might be a place that is honoring to you in every way.